This is an interview that John Smith did with his aunt, Alice Moulton Barker, in November of 2002, where she tells of her memories of Lucasville. Remembering um, the first memories I have of the, actually of the night the store burned. I remember that very, very plainly. And it, there was a knock on the door, and Mildred Wolf came to the door and told Mother that the store was on fire. And Harold. Uh, was young, his, his in his teens, and my mother sent him out to yell fire all around town. Since uh, Phyllis and I were small and uh, not even in school yet, my mother couldn't leave till uh, Mrs. M Miss Mayhew, that was staying with Dr. Coleman, came over to uh, take care of us. Watch you. And the, the building, the, the store was a, just like Brant and Apples, that long look that I think Rant and Apples and Klein's and and uh, our store and they were all built alike and probably by the same people. Uh, uh, mother finally got us situated and she ran to Main Street and tried to get some help to save something. My grandmother's house was nearby and all the Moulton men were gone. They had gone to Cincinnati for some, I don't know if it was a Masonic meeting or what it was, but there wasn't a one of them in, in Lucasville. And she was alone with just Harold. And the Buckeye Public Service Company had the electric in this town. And the minute the, minute the fire started, time for them to shut off all the lights. Of course, they didn't need any lights because the fire was clear up to the sky. And, uh, uh, the bucket brigade uh, did all they could, but they couldn't, they wasn't, couldn't even make a dent in it, couldn't stop it. Somebody broke in the front window and took a little chair and uh, some other little something out, out of the front window. And for a while, it looked like the whole block was going to go. And uh, they, when they saw it was impossible to save the store, they started wetting down grandmother's house. And the fire did burn one corner of it. But they got it out, finally. My mother was trying to get help to save some of my grandmother's things. She always said they carried the feather beds downstairs and threw the dishes out the window. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, the Henrys lived next door in that house next to grandmother's, which was the one on the corner that they tore down. That's Young's. Yeah. And uh, Pat and his wife were making a, a portiers out of a paper that they hung in the doorways. They hung, it was quite fashionable to have portiers in your doorway. And they were making them out of wallpaper. We twisted them and put them on a string and so forth. And uh, they had quite a few left and he just scooped them up and put them in the slop jar. Uh, they put Mrs. Henry's dress dummy uh, out in the yard, out in the street, some fellas are out in the sidewalk probably, and they some of the you know, local jokesters and dressed the dummy up. And my mother ran into it several times, she said. And before she realized it was a dummy, and she said, the next thing they know, my mother had knocked it out in the middle of the street. <laughs> She's so disgusted. When the news uh, made it to the Moulton family, living in the country, that was Uncle uh, Earl and his family, they came to our house to help. Morris Caldwell picked them up and brought them to Lucasville. And it was Phil, Martha, and Chandler. They got there after the store had fallen in. Chandler wanted to know if they saved any candy. <laughs> he said he hoped it didn't all burn up. When the Moulton uh, men arrived home the next day, the store was gone. We had relatives coming out our ears. They all stayed for several days. That I do remember. Trying to get grandmother's house back in shape. <clears throat> Harold was so hoarse, 
he couldn't talk. We had to use the oil lamps for several days. The electric lines were burnt out. The only thing that came out of the fire was a child's wooden chair, which was in the front window. And they made plans for a new store. Um, I can just remember grandfather's sister, Aunt Beck Jones. She was a darling, and he, she was a half-sister. She lived next door to our house and, uh, on West Street. She was a tall lady who uh, wore a black shawl all the time. I can see her and remember that black shawl she wrapped around her. She didn't own a, they didn't own coats in those days. They just had these big shawls they wrapped up in. <clears throat> she had a son, Chan Jones, who graduated from the Naval Academy. He was the handsomest fella. He had a Spanish-looking wife and a Paul Parrot who talked, and we were just amazed at that. <laughs> uh, they went to California, and I, they died out in California and were buried there. Uh, and Beck's husband was Buck Jones, who owned the farm where uh, Uncle Earl lived. And uh, during the 1913 flood, he lost everything he had. <clears throat> It was a terrible flood that year. He came home and killed himself in that house next door in that front room. <clears throat> this is what my mother told me. The soup terrine over there on that uh, chest is the one that Mother gave to Helen on her 40th birthday. Also, the cover lid that's hanging in the hall uh, was one that uh, came from my the Jones house. Uh, Grandma Moulton's house was where Harold Young lived. Aunt Mabel, Aunt Mabel made it <coughs> a beautiful experience to visit. She had cut flowers around the huge living room and her front porch was the most beautiful. She had a big wicker swing that's on the front porch up here uh, which we played train on. It went sideways. <clears throat> uh, there were wicker chairs with beautiful cushions and a bench that said, forget thy cares and rest. And it was the most uncomfortable thing you ever saw. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the living room <clears throat> had lots of easy chairs. A big fireplace and a couch. Tom Moulton has the couch. That had a big high back and a uh, and it was upholstered. It was in tapestry. And I thought it was the biggest thing I ever saw until I saw it at Tom's and it looked like a midget. Huh. A bit of midget. Aunt Mabel one Christmas uh, fixed a beautiful tree in an upstairs bedroom. And I don't know how old we were, but when we all went upstairs and she opened the door, it was unbelievable. And gifts for all of us. All the aunts, uncles, and families were there. The side porch was screened in with a place to relax and a table for summer meals. There was a small kitchen, which wasn't very big, and I mean small, and a back stairway that went up to the second floor. And one of the youngs took that out as soon as they got there. They made the kitchen bigger and I took the stairway out. Uh, there was a beautiful stairway in the front hall to the second floor. The rooms upstairs, uh, the one room front upstairs bedroom, Aunt Mabel painted the floor black and then she took white paint and dabbed the whole floor. It looked like a cat had been walking through the paint. Her brothers thought she'd lost her mind. It was a sad day when the house was sold. They said grandmother needed the money. She and Aunt Mabel moved to the Rickies when Aunt Jane's children started to come. Aunt Mabel raised them. She raised the Ricky children. She would bring them here every summer for them during the summer. And Aunt Jane and Uncle Branch came visiting when it was time for school. They moved back to St. Louis. <clears throat> That's where they were. He was with the Cardinals then. There were six children. Mary, Branch, Jane, Mabel, Alice, Sue, Betty. We always called Branch Junior Boy. 
because for a long time he didn't have a name. They couldn't decide what they were going to call him. So, uh, the Aunt Jane's name was really Jenny. But when they got older, and it was changed to Jane. Grandma would have celebrated her 100th birthday in several months, but she just didn't make it. She was a little tiny woman, and Aunt Mabel was a little tiny. When she wore a one and a half B shoe, not even five feet tall. Wow. <clears throat> Aunt Mabel, she told me one time when my boyfriend told me he would be there, I should not wait more than a half hour. <laughs> I told her <clears throat> I'd rather wait a half hour than all my life. Wasn't that <laughs> nasty? She never married. She went with Lou McKinley, oh. but she never married. It's hard to believe that time has passed the fast and memories come back about Grandma's house. Aunt Margaret's house was different too. They were comfortable and they were comfortable. I can't read the rest of that. They don't claim I did. Uh, Aunt Margaret's house is where the filling station is now. Where the 76. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was her house. Actually, golf now. Uh -huh. Actually, they've changed to golf now. Yeah. Richards. Yeah. Yeah. In the 40s, the war came along. And uh, Bob decided he was not going in. I was married to Bob, not married to Bob then. And he decided he wasn't going in the infantry. So he joined the Civil Air Patrol and flew out of Raven Rock Airport. Uh, in a Piper Cub plane. He wasn't the best pilot in the world. He, he'd fly over my house and dip his wings. I had salmon blue dresses. They were denim with white braid trim. I'd have Phyllis put on one and I'd have the other and I'd talk her into going out waving at it. He didn't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> he finally made the Air Corps when they were after him. The draft board, he was sent to Fort Thomas, Kentucky from there to Keesler Field, and from there to the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa for training in light planes. <clears throat> he was, uh, he made up his mind he was going in the Air Corps, so he waits till the, whoever's in charge of the draft board, he waits till they're not there, so he goes in and talks the girl into signing him up to go in the Air Corps. He was slated for the infantry, but he talked, it's too late then, after he signed the papers, he was going to the Air Corps. Uh, so I went down to, to uh, Tuscaloosa, and that's where I was married by a Presbyterian minister in a church rectory. I returned home to my job at Atlas and hoped the war would end someday. He washed out once and was reinstated, washed out again. So he was sent several places, trained him for a gunner, and he was too tall. He couldn't sit in the gunner's seat. He finally ended up an MP and was sent to the West Coast, led it on a boat, and sent to Guam, the paradise of the Pacific. Seven degrees most of the time, but there were Japs that the Marines hadn't cleaned out. A B-29 base, it was a B-29 base that bombed the Japanese. The B-29 from Tinian, I think, dropped the first uh, hydrogen bomb on Hiroshima. The Enola Gay, uh, uh, piloted by Paul Tibbetts, and he was uh, was the, in charge of the Columbus Airport later. Beginning and the end of the war, we the war widows were at, from Atlas Fashion had rented a camp on the Souda River over the railroad, close to where Hearts is now. We called it Widows Retreat. And we went there every Thursday afternoon and Saturday night after work. And we had fun. The guys on the railroad loved it. They'd blow their whistle and hang out the cab windows because here were all these nice looking gals laying out in swimsuits getting a tan. Uh, 
Libby Schaefer, uh, Greta Jackson, her husband was a major in the Army, uh, Libby's husband was in the Battle of the Bulge, Betty Ferguson's husband was in the Navy, uh, and Rosemary Burks was in the Navy, and uh, Bob was in the Air Corps on Guam. There were so many weeks, we worked the canteen at the railroad station, serving sandwiches, cakes, and drinks to traveling servicemen. The troop, when the troop trains went through, uh, we they had to stop there to get water or whatever they had to do, and we felt like we did a bit for the cause. Uh, we went after work. We worked all night, and then uh, on Saturday night, and then went went home, went to bed. Uh, our store sold war bonds. From Questel and William Atlas traveled around and were. We had a contest in the store, who's to see which was the best sales girl to sell bonds, it wasn't me. Um, Bob went OL, AWOL before he shipped out to Guam. I was looking in the mirror in the hat department and he was standing, I looked up and he was standing behind me. Uh, Mr. Atlas told me to go home and not come back till he left. He was, he, he was very patriotic. Uh, Almost every girl in the store had uh, someone in the service, and his son was on a B-29 uh, crew, and uh, he was a navigator, and he lost, uh, he got, in one of the uh, trips over Japan, he got shrapnel in his hand, and he didn't have to go two times, and uh, so he, Mr. Atlas got the uh, condolences from the crew members that were lost on the plane. They didn't know that Morton wasn't with them. Well, they brought Morton home from uh, uh, Tinny, and I think he was on, uh, in a straitjacket. He just lost it completely. Huh. Uh, they they gave him medicine to keep him awake when they, when they took these trips. They had enough uh, fuel to take him to Japan mm. and back. And it was it was very stressful. And on June the sixth, we got to work. The war was over in Europe. It was after we got to work, we just put what we what we had been doing and walked out of the store. Mother Atlas tried to stop us, saying they let us have the next day off. We just kept on walking. <laughs> we didn't stop. And everybody marched up and down the street screaming. And the, we went to Shawnee Forest and bought some stuff and we went on a picnic. Then we forgot about Japan. Germany was defeated, but we still had to think about Japan. So it was almost <clears throat> it was almost hard to get gas. It was rationed, so you had to save all you could. So one Sunday night, we'd go with Libby Schaefer and all the widows would get together and go to the movies. As a matter of fact, I was in bed with Libby when her husband came home from overseas. He knocked on the door. He he wasn't expected until the next day. They didn't know he'd been released. And uh, she had her hair up on curler. <laughs> She'd been a 22 and a half when he left. Now she was a size 16. Walt <laughs> looked at her and said, Libby, if I'd have seen you from the rear, I'd never known who you were. <laughs> So her sister-in-law and I ran downstairs, cut the chocolate cake they were saving for Mom, and and his, her brother brought home a case of Coke, and you couldn't hardly steal a bar, a bottle of Coke. He had a whole case because he worked at Coca-Cola. So here we were, sitting around the table drinking Coke and eating chocolate cake, and it was all rationed. But, you know, I mean, you can you just were lucky if you came by any of it. We were friends. We were such good friends because our husbands were at war, and we were lucky our husbands got home. After everyone got home, we all got together, but we had other things to worry us, where to live. Bob and I moved up over the Moose Hall at the corner of 9th and Chillicothe Street. Bill and Annette Miller moved to Columbus, and we got the apartment. It was three rooms and a hall. 
two tiny rooms and a big kitchen. We had a pickup, we had pickup furniture, roll away bed for a couch and a chair and a table filled the living room. Bedroom, dresser, and bed. A hall was two chests and room to walk. Kitchen had a window, refrigerator, and two burner gas stoves. The hot water tank was in the closet, and that's what warmed the apartment. <laughs> we had several parties. We sat the furniture out in the hall and sat on the floor. Then we found out 1662 Grant Street was for sale. It was a mansion to us. We paid cash, my money, and Bob's and Mamie's. We paid all but a small balance and asked Mamie for the rest. We worked hard and fixed it up rather modern and looked like everybody else. Then I decided I didn't like the look. We were able to buy some antiques, put up brown organy curtains, and took down those horrible drapes. I gave ten dollars a week every payday to pay Mamie back. It was supposed to put ten dollars in the fund. One day I thought it should be paid. He was collecting my money for weeks and putting it in the bank in his name. And when I questioned him, he admitted he'd paid me back months ago. But if I needed money, I could just go down to the bank and get it. Yeah, they informed me with it, without his signature, I couldn't get the money. Then after 10 years, I found out I was pregnant. He insisted I had an abortion. He got a convert. I, he would get a convertible, and we would have a wonderful time with no babies. I worked on Saturday, had her on Sunday. And when we came home from the hospital, we cried for three months. Then I had a seizure. They had to take her to mother's. Mrs. Silkett, who lived next door, took her and kept her for a while. And let's see. What's been after that? Let's see. You don't want to hear that anyway. <clears throat> Maybe I'll for his funeral. I don't think you want to hear that either. Mother was a real pusher when it came to voting. She would meet us at the front porch and ask if we voted. She wouldn't let us in the house till we did. She always said women work too hard to get the vote, not to use it. She marched years ago so so we could vote. She was also for making the township dry. That was 60 years ago, and it's still dry. Mm -hmm. Jay Kinsler's mother had a had a beer joint in town, and Joe Turner had one across the river. She never rested till she got she and Mr. Underwood, uh, John Underwood's father, got it voted out. It didn't solve the problem. We had we had bootleggers then. You could go down the bottoms and buy it. One day in school, the MRA, National Recovery Act, works, came to work, and Charlie Blevins had on a school jacket. He came to find out Bucktail Nance had traded his school jacket for some whiskey. He was a ball player. When he didn't pay, Charlie wore the jacket while he was working. I suppose the coach got the jacket back. Bucktown was put off the team. I was elected president of the Athletic Association. I remember we had to cook our own banquet. We brought food from home and cooked it at home ec room. There wasn't much money, so we had to make, make our own clothes, not only for sports banquets, but also for junior senior prom. Only we couldn't have it at school because we weren't allowed to dance. One year we went to the Washington Hotel, one in Crystal Springs in Wheelersburg. Our junior year I went with Eugene McKenzie, next year with Joseph Colgrove. The boys were lucky to have suits, the girls had homemade dresses. I don't remember corsages, but Mother made me a lightweight coat, nubby beige material. I thought I was really something. One year, 
It was the dotted Swiss flower print with puss sleeves. It was a formal. Scoop neck, double white ordinary ruffles, and a low scoop neck and sleeves print was blue with touches of light. I, I thought I was hot fit. I was with a senior, and we had a busy summer working at home at the store and riding my bicycle. Great fun. My dad had the store, and we could get material and make our clothes. Mother was a perfectionist, and we couldn't see her. I had dates with Jean McKenzie, and we'd taken up money whenever we went any place to see where we could afford. Some of the gang didn't have a cent, so we didn't have too much money. So we'd drive up to Thomas Hollow. It was dead end at the bridge, so we all parked and and. Next, sometimes there would be 20, two or three cars, sometimes as many as 10. We car hopped and talked. Some would drink some whiskey and the boys would drink and we, the girls didn't partake. Other times in the summer, we'd go down to the river on the sandbar, build a fire and cook, sing songs, wander off. One special time, we went to Grimes Camp and took boat rides, set off fireworks and Hey, no money, but lots of fun. Everybody was in the same boat. How we doing? Oh, anytime. We can stop there if you want. Go ahead. Go. Dad had a, had a little old hillside farm with a tobacco allotment, and Russ Nelson lived up there. And Dad went up to check on berries and tobacco, and we took the two dogs, Patsy and Herman, with him. Dad was the world's worst driver, and he ran off the bridge. We probably got that in that, too. Uh -huh. That's okay. Go ahead. The dogs got out of the car and wouldn't get back in. Russ got the car back on the bridge, and Dad came home, minus the dogs. They were asking about the dogs. He said, they wouldn't get back in the car. <laughs> that was replied. They have more sense than you. So <laughs> Phil and I drove back up the horse run and the dogs were sitting waiting for us. Dad had a Ford agency and he'd taken a, cup, a coupe with a rumble seat. And it was a sh sharp little car, but it had a cover on the spare tar that advertised beer. And of course, Mother told him to take off the cover. Dad said he didn't think that. Mother was a great believer in women taking part in politics and issues concerning families. She hated E.O. McCann with a passion. <laughs> he was county superintendent, and she called the people that served on the county board his henchmen. That's her description. <laughs> they controlled everything in the schools. One of Dad's friends was Pete Klein, who owned Fine Store. And they'd been friends for years. And he was on the McCann side. Mother had no use for him after that. That just, that just did it. So uh, he came over one day uh, after a, an election and the animal accounts had lost. Mother had done everything she could do and so people in the county that couldn't stand EO. So um, he came to the sidewalk and yelled for Dad. And uh, so Mother went out on the porch and she said, Pete, don't take one step on that sidewalk. You're not coming in here. You just come in here to go. <laughs> well, he said, I'm sorry, Bert, but said I'm bringing a death message. Abby James had died. She lived in that house where Dr. Wilson lives now. And... Uh, But he had, uh, with McCown, he had his uh, group of teachers and he uh, let some of the real good teachers go and hired his friends. And uh, so, several years later, he ran for Congress. Uh, he says, let's get out and send him to Washington. Let's get rid of him. <laughs> well, <laughs> mother was thrilled when he was elected. But the funny part of it was, his son just <laughs> took his father's job. Yeah, took over <laughs> for him. <laughs> but he, was, he wasn't near as bad as his dad. His dad would come to the, EO would come to the graduation. He attended every graduation in the schools in the county. And he always started out with 
stay long, stay long, and ship and stay. So it got to be real funny. So when he get up to say that, <clears throat> we'd all say it together on the stage when we graduated because we thought he was hilarious. Uh, uh, we talked about throwing the, the uh, things off of the bridge, didn't we? The flyers, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, The county fair was one thing that was uh, in our life. We all had to go to the county fair. I can remember going when I was a little tiny girl, and uh, Helen drove uh, a car, and I never will forget. John Dahl was drunk. Um, he backed or he uh, ran into her. That's the only wreck she ever had. She said, and that wasn't her fault. And mother made all these jellies and everything, and uh, she she was a loved to can and she loved to sew and she was an expert seamstress. But she was so good that Phyllis and I couldn't suit her. And every time we do anything, our forage project, we had to rip it out two or three times because it wasn't perfect. Do it over again. Yes. <laughs> uh, Dad was secretary of the fair. Uh, Grand. Paul Rockwell was uh, the fair. Uh, uh, he was secretary, and, and Grandpa and all the brothers had all Dad's brothers had um, was on the fair board, and uh, it, it was a there was only one year that they didn't have a fair, and I think that was 1942. They asked him not to have it. I don't think they had much of anything that year. I think no. that's the year they didn't have baseball World Series. Or, yeah. Yeah, nothing much. And I still go to the fair working in the antique building, which is a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. You see a lot of people. A lot of people. If you just stay put, you see everybody that comes to the fair. Mm hmm. Um, can we talk about the uh, flood and the. No. When I was at OSU, this 37 flood, um, I was at uh, Columbus at OSU, and uh, it was really uh, terrible down here. We were cut off completely. Uh, there was just no way to get into Lucasville because it was cut off up above and down at the farm. The prison, it's a prison farm now. It was cut off there. And out in Pine, and uh, Klein's Pond was uh, over the road, and uh, the Souda River was up, and we just were completely cut off. And uh, Mother had taken in uh, some people, I don't know, she, half a ward, I don't know who else she, they kids took in to stay with them. And uh, it was, uh, we, we had pictures when on the newsreels uh, when we went to movies that showed all these different things. <clears throat> In the first trip, when I was able to get a bus home on the weekend, first weekend we came down to come down 104 and the, the uh, debris was on the telephone lines or the electric lines. It was that high. high. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, Probably knocked out all the power, didn't it? Oh, it destroyed everything. I mean, you know, everybody was in the yeah. same shape. Right. Uh, during the war, uh, your dad went in with Battery B, and uh, he called Phyllis and told her that they were shipping out, and that there was a couple in Portsmouth that were going. Their son was with him, and they were going to drive through to Indian Town Gap. Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. They go from Indiantown Gap to the point of embarkation. I don't know. Probably must have been cross country because they went to the, the Tonga Islands uh, mm -hmm. in the Pacific. So and, they had to go to California or someplace probably. So uh, they, he called and so she said she was going to go. Well, mother and dad both had a fit. Never been any place. You can't go. You can't go. I'm going. <laughs> so she met these people and they started and before they got 
they had their car broke down. Some little, some place, I don't know exactly where it was, but Phyllis got out. They were, they worked on the car and got started, and they were going to come back home. They said they were afraid to keep going. So she goes and gets the bus ticket and goes to Indian Town Dad to see your dad. And uh, they walked for, I don't know how many hours, for fear she would, something would happen to her, somebody knock her in the head, or she'd get lost, or, yeah. but she got over there and got back. And the rest of us, uh, we, we sort of ran around and had a group, but she'd come once in a while, but most of the time she planned a garden over there across the street where the, uh, where the garage is now. She had her a big garden and she just worked and worked and worked and she, uh, she really enjoyed it. She didn't take much part in all this frivolous stuff that we were doing, but our thing was to keep busy and not worry about anything. So, when I first started work, uh, I started work at the beginning of the, beginning of the war, I think it was, or just before, but I remember that uh, I would catch a ride over at uh, Logan's. They had come back in. It's, it's where Wendy's is now. And Millard Logan was, uh, and uh, his wife had the restaurant. And uh, Millard, I, ne I never will forget, he opened the door and I was waiting. He said, Alice, they just bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was and didn't even, didn't realize what really important it was and how uh, things were going to heat up right I, away. I don't think a lot of people did. And so uh, I went on to work and uh, I don't, I can't remember who I used to catch a ride with them, but then something happened to the ride that probably went in service or something. But anyway, uh, I had to, to get to work, I had to get up early and go over to the corner and I rode with uh, um, Dick Schoonover from the High Power Company. They'd see me stand alongside the road and they'd pick me up and Dallas Huddleston, he went down for ice every day down there. And uh, uh, Miss uh, Davis's brother, Esther Davis's wife's brother, what was his name? I can't, uh, can't think of it right now. But anyway, he worked for State Highway. Well, then they, they didn't have any objection to them picking people up. Of course, there wasn't any problem then. If I could get down to town, I could get home. Bob would bring me home. But uh, that's before we went to service, of course. And I, I never will forget one day I came in a little bit late, Mr. Atlas. Real upset. One of the girls said, Well, you realize how she gets to work? And when I'd come in every morning, they'd say, Well, who did you ride with this morning? <laughs> who picked you up this morning? <laughs> <laughs> Finally got a ride with uh, uh, Lee and Brushart. Um, they lived where the, that uh, store is up here on 23. They had a she was a glaze and she married a brush heart and her son was in my class at school and so I finally got a ride with her. She worked at Pitts. And she took the Red Cross course on the auto mechanics. And she if anything happened to the car, she'd get a wrench out and she'd pound on the edge. <laughs> that was kind of funny because generally it didn't go. <laughs> She was such a character, and uh, then I read. They lived where? Which store is? Or that used to be Conrad's. Uh, oh yeah, Hanson's or not Hanson's? Uh, and uh, funny part of it was, she married this fella, and I forget what his name was. It's been his name, Waddell, and uh, he was a real character. He was he was a con man if there ever was one. So. Uh, their house burned. And poor little old Lillian, she didn't have sense enough to know that she shouldn't say anything. She said, when she got in the car one morning, she says, well, at least I got my fur coat and all my uh, 
pictures out. She said that I put them in the garage. <laughs> well, the Farm Bureau refused to pay the money for the house, but they did put a, a back on that lot a little cottage. Uh, but they didn't pay pay for a little cottage to be put up. But they didn't pay any. They knew it was arson, but they couldn't prove it. That's they say that's very difficult to prove. So, uh, <laughs> and her son was uh, as soon as we graduated from high school, he went in the navy, and that was before the war started. And so he was a great playboy, and he. In one of his, uh, when he was off the ship, he got drunk and he burned his uniform out. <laughs> well, they put him in a, they, in the brig, probably. They put him in the brig and was going to keep him there. He was going to have to serve, I forget how much. Well, he got malaria and they sent him home. They released him with a dishonorable discharge and sent him home. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the story she told didn't, have, didn't sound like that at all. <laughs> that was the truth because he tried to enlist in the army, and they sent Harold Her was the the uh, clerk of the draft board, uh -huh. and he they, he got the letter that said that he, they, he was undesirable. He'd been released from the navy, navy, and that no way did they want him, even if there was a war on. Yeah. <laughs> so we probably. Heard the truth. Yeah. <laughs> the truth came out. Yeah. Um, I think I don't think people realize what it, how the uh, people lived back during the depression. There was no help for anybody. I mean, it was just just do the best you could. And get and by the best. Get by you the best you could, and with us. Uh, with the school kids, what we did was we just pooled our money and then whatever money we had, we that's what we did. And one of our favorite things was to go down on the riverbank and build a big fire and sit around and sing and mm -hmm. carry on. And uh, Jesse Schoonover uh, always enjoyed to having the kids and she her house was always open. People were just coming and going all the time. And uh, the boys, Jim and Charlie Workman, and those boys uh, were there in and out all the time. And oh, she did. She loved the boys. She didn't care much about the girls, but the boys were pretty special. <laughs> and she would make chocolate cake every weekend, and that's what we'd do. We'd run down to Jesse to get a piece of chocolate cake. Uh, so uh, she was a great churchgoer and worked at the fair. She was worked at the fair every year and uh, used to tell, used to say about it. We all should go to church and preach, you know, about that. She told the neighbor next door that, uh, you know, she said, "Well, you won't go to heaven because you don't go to church." And this lady told her. Said, well, Jesse, I expect my prayers from our army board will go just as far as yours will from the church. So that was very insulting to Jesse. So she thought, but if you didn't go to church, you weren't going to go to heaven. fashion was Helen Bradshaw worked for the employment office. She was a, uh, one of the clerks at the employment office and uh, Mrs. they had a class uh, for people that needed jobs and uh, so I went down and went to the class and uh, Mrs. Atlas, but we called her Mother Atlas because she was Mr. Atlas's, wasn't his mother but they, that was the way the store spoke of her Mother Atlas. And so we went, uh, I went down to the, took the class, and so I was chosen as one of them that she took to work at Dallas Fashion. And uh, 
that's where I got my education. I thought I knew a lot, but I didn't know anything until I got into the retail business. It was really funny. I started eleven fifty a week. <laughs> a whole week. Eleven dollars fifty cents for a whole week. Of course when you didn't have anything, eleven fifty was a, a lot of money. A lot of money. <clears throat> and uh, people uh, then they started the uh, Roosevelt started the NRA and put a lot of people to work. Uh, they did. They had a sewing uh, group at the over at the community hall that made uh, lay, uh, layouts and things and made different things for people that didn't have anything. And they uh, put a lot of women to sewing. And uh, Dad had the store, and most of the people he had couldn't pay the bills. I mean, you know, they didn't have any money. Right. And uh, several times, I know Alfie that worked in the office, we called her Alfie, Alf, but her name was Alf. <laughs> Alfie. And uh, she'd been with Grandpa, and she'd been with, uh, and then when Dad got the store, she stayed and worked there. And she was the real character. Never busy keeping Phil's and I out of candy can. <laughs> okay. uh, she would say to Dad, you you know, these people, you can't, you, they just throw too much, you can't. He'd say, well, it's cold, they've got to have something to eat. And, of course, that was his downfall. He let them all mm -hmm. take advantage of him, but they never paid him. Most of them never paid him. And uh, it just seemed like it just went downhill from there. Then when the store burned, of course, when he built the new store, well, then the depression hit, and he had the car agency, Ford agency, well then the government stepped in and you could, they wouldn't let them sell the cars only to doctors and mailmen and somebody that had a reason. You couldn't, you couldn't buy a car without an order. So, I mean, and there was no, and they weren't making cars, they were making bombers up at Willow Run in Michigan, the big they bought, uh, they made this big barn plant up there, and they, all, everything was sold, I mean, was, uh, the government. For the war a, effort. Yeah, everything was for the war effort, but it, if they had any cars, it was put a, you couldn't buy them unless you had a, you couldn't buy gasoline without stamps, and you couldn't buy shoes without stamps, uh, and some, you couldn't buy sugar, and there were so many things you couldn't, couldn't get without stamps. And uh, without an order from the government, he couldn't sell the car. And uh, it was just one of those things that went from bad to worse. Finally, he just had to call it quits. I mean, there wasn't any other way out. He couldn't, he couldn't pay the bank, and he couldn't. So they just foreclosed, and they sold everything. Mm -hmm. But most of the people probably would have paid if they could have, but they, they just didn't have it. There's no, they, there was an old age pension, I think, at one time that these people could uh, get a little bit oh, of money. No. Yeah, but that's for the old, older people. And the, uh, there was a, the CC, C camp, three C camp that took the young men and sent them all over the United States where they built roads and they built Shawnee Forest or Forest, Shawnee Lodge and they, those kind of things were part of the National Recovery Act that Roosevelt was putting in for right. these people to work. And of course the war came along then all those people, those young men that were in the three sea camps went directly right. in service. Yeah. And uh, your dad was on Tonga Islands all the time. He didn't get a trip to, I think, to Australia once, but most of the time he was, they were holding the Tonga Islands in the Pacific, is what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, they weren't in harm's way, but they could have been, who knows, you know. The, I guess the Japanese weren't interested in that island. Bob was on uh, Guam. He went in on Guam. Um, they had captured Guam. The Marines had taken Guam, and then 
they sent in the CBs, and the CBs built the airstrips for the B-29s, and the B-29, <coughs> your dad was in a B-29, or your, uh, Bob was in a B-29 group, and he was the MP. He washed out of flight training, and they, uh, he, he just, uh, they, they just gathered them up and shipped them to South Pacific, the whole Guam, mm -hmm. and uh, it was, uh, was very exciting, I guess. They said they went into Guam and uh, they gave them, uh, they just shot, they had to stand uh, guard over the the uh, runways for the B-29s and they they were s scared all the time and stood at night and every time anything moved they shot. <laughs> so finally they gave one boy and told them, now, if you see a Jap, kill him. <laughs> they had cleaned up most, a lot of the Japs. But I read an article several years ago where the two Japs come out of the jungle years after the war. Didn't know the war was over. Uh -huh. And uh, they've been hiding in there all that been time. Been hiding in there for years. Mm -hmm. They didn't know the war was over. I Or not. Oh, I, I don't guess I talked about when Helen, when you all went up to Helen's and gathered all the leaves up and out in the front. So they all lined up. And they just loved town. Y'all just loved town's house because there's a great big place to lots of room and lots of fun. And so uh, all the radiators to hang the wet clothes on. Everything. Well, they, uh, that day uh, they had all the leaves that was just out in the street. And so uh, you went first and jumped in the leaves. And then uh, Mary went next and jumped in. And then Wiki went next and jumped in. And then uh, Carl jumped in again. He was the last one, he thought. And then here comes Skip. And he jumped in right in the middle of all of them. And they had leaves all over the place. Helen <laughs> was so upset after she broke them up so nice. <laughs> We unranked them, huh? <laughs> yeah, you sure did. <laughs> Living in, and uh, it had a 
fireplace in the living room, and uh, it was a cute little place. We got it fixed up. And we didn't have any couch. We had a day bed, that, or a bed that Tom had had when he was at Oak Ridge, and we fixed it up for a couch, and we got furniture, and it was fun doing it. And then in 1969, when Lona's house was empty, why we bid on it and talked to uh, uh, Ray Grimes, or Donald, Donald Grimes, who was married to Lona's, Lona McNamer, and we bought that house for $6,000, and it was full of stuff. I mean, full junk. Mm -hmm. And we went, when we went in, uh, and signed the papers and paid for it, and Tom called on the telephone down at the store, and I told the Irma, I said, don't, uh, tell him I'm not here. There was three feet of water in the basement. <laughs> he said, Alice, did you look in the basement of that house? And I said, no, I didn't. He said, oh, you should have. There's three feet of water down there. <laughs> so we find out, I don't know how we ever got the water out, but we did. Then <laughs> the house was a wreck. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of work, but it was fun. I mean, and so um, the day that I decided that uh, we were going to move, Tom kept saying he's going to hire somebody to come and move us. He'd do it the next day, but he never did. So one Thursday, while I was off, I got up and I went down the fences and I got all of you on your feet. And I said, We're going to move today. <laughs> <laughs> so we. Uh, Moved on, got the wagon, uh, little wagon, the little red wagon, <laughs> and loaded it up with, with furniture, and moved up to, the, to that house. We moved everything but the stove and the refrigerator and the couch. We moved all the beds, all the dressers, everything. And your mother washed all the curtains and got them ready, to put back up. And when Tom came home that night, we was in the house. <laughs> and he couldn't believe what we'd done. And I think I was two weeks getting him to move the refrigerator and the stove and the couch, but we did get it finally. And it was fun. And when, uh, I, did I say anything about Carl and the, on the roof? Uh -huh. And so there was a summer kitchen, and it had a coal stove, and it had a bunch of stuff in it. And so uh, we decided that uh, the chimney was crumbly, and it was this, but they had put a brick chimney on the top. So we went with the, decided that we'd take the chimney down. So Carl got up on the roof and he tied a rope around it. Phyllis and I got down on the ground on this, on the side next to the house. So we, when he said, now when you yell, pull, you yell, pull, and then we'll pull. So, he said, this knocked the chimney off, and Phyllis and I left the ground. We sold on to that rope. <laughs> Our feet left the ground. But we got rid of the chimney. The chimney's sitting down there in Wick's yard. It's still down there. We never did it. Pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe I might have told that before. Sure. The kids loved the hill. You kids loved the hill over there next to the cottage. It was a good place to sleigh ride and build a fire. All the neighbor kids would come in and down the hill they'd go. They just had it when we had no snow for a sleigh ride. Life. It was fun. Well, I think that's about it.